Who knows? This is not a small one. Come on. Let's check this one. No, there's nothing on this. The wind is howling now. So I haven't got much longer left. Hi folks. Dave here, Berry Hill Lakes in the Surrey Hills. A few tips on basic open-ended swim feeder fishing for bream. Traditional method, been going for many years, very effective, very enjoyable, and going to try and endeavour to tell you the basic pattern and setup for this method. Um, and what we tend to use are open-ended cage feeders. This is a particular model that's got grips on the inside which obviously does encourage the bait to hold in there a bit longer. Naturally they will come in different sizes and you can obviously alternate the size by the way of a clip link which you can hopefully see here. It's a snap link setup so if you did want to actually change the feeder setup it can be done very quickly without having to do undo any line, quickly unclip the feeder, right lads, awesome army, I want to use a smaller feeder, I'll take the big chap off, pick up a smaller one, invariably most feeders come with a swivel already linked in, just put it on there, if you can see that, little quick link and you're back in business again. Quick change, link swivel, different formats, but very, very useful. If you decide, oh, they've had enough of a feeder, I'll put a straight ledger on. That can also be attached. Anything with a nice little swivel on a ledger type feeder will attach on there very quickly. Um, when you use an open end cage feeder, you're mixing up ground bait. And then you put that in a bowl and you obviously insert it into the feeder. Several ways you can do that, several tips here, which hopefully get you a few more fish. I'm often in a competitive situation and try to get those extra fish out of the swim by little tricks and benefits and advantages that, you know, work very, very well. Um, so the first tip really is to have your, a round bowl to put your ground bait in. Mix it in advance if possible. When you get to your fishing swim, Mix your ground bait first, because what it does, it takes time to absorb the water. If you're suddenly ready to fish, mix the ground bait up, the consistency won't be quite right. Uh, so therefore, the mixing is important. It may not appear so, but it really is. So the first job, mix the ground bait, let it stand, tackle up, back to the ground bait, it's dried up a bit. A bit more water, because it's absorbed that water. Tad more at the end, and you get a lovely, soft, fluffy mix. That's the first tip to not have it too lumpy. We carry little unnecessary tip, but it is a help. I carry a small sieve. So if I once I've mixed the ground bait up, it stood for half an hour, a bit like you know grandma's bread and cake and that. When it's stood and it's a perfect consistency, I sieve it and it's surprising how many lumps are in there. And a fine, lovely, subtle ground bait mix is really helpful. And the fish don't come across lumps they'll feed carpet feed over it more confidently and it'll you know catch more fish for sure I've proved that over the years okay we've just spoken briefly about mixing up your ground bait in advance now what do you put in it naturally the ground bait's going to go into the feeder um, you don't want it too stodgy every time you wind in the ground bait's got to come out so one other quick tip just suddenly thought of if you're finding your ground bait still in the feeder when you wound back in it's too stodgy it's not uh, light and fluffy enough but anyway then i mix some particles and my bait in the bowl ready to insert into the feeder quite important but one other thing is quite important not too much if you get too many pellets maggots corn casters or sweet corn or whatever in the mix it won't hold together consistently it will break up so you put in the bare minimum of loose feed but you can put anything in pellets are very good holding bait uh, sweet corn casters anything that doesn't wriggle into the silt stays on top forms a carpet and lies there to bring the feeding fish into the area but the key we must repeat is in the smallest amount. Firstly, you don't want to overfeed the fish. The more you get in there, the more you'll feed them and the more they'll 
not want to have your hook plate and also the casting if you've got too many bits and bobs in there larger pellets and other particles in particular when you go out it will break up you want it to stay in that feeder hit the water travel to the bottom of the lake or river and then come out and disperse once it's landed on the bottom build up one tight little area in the river in the lake where the feeder will land in the same spot every time. No good casting here, then everywhere. The fish get confused, a bit of food here, a bit there. They don't know where they're coming or going. Try and keep it in one area as tight as you can justify. Obviously your technique in casting, uh, if you can practice casting and improve the accuracy, it will help concentrate more fish into a smaller area and you'll catch more because they're not so confused. Um, when you cast out, one quick tip, get the rod and think it was a clock. And sometimes your feeder might go to the left, to the right, you're thinking, what's going on? It's going in all different directions. The key is to keep the rod, think it was a clock, a, a, a needle on a clock, 12 o'clock. If it's at 1 or 11, it'll fly off at an angle. If you look up and just take your time, no rush, get the rod behind you, bring the rod back to about 1 o'clock, but keep the rod straight. Imagine it's the clock, 12 o'clock, dead right. And if you cast gently forward with the rod up straight at this 12 o'clock angle, the feeder will go straight. And that's, again, down to practice, but the angle of which you're casting will improve the accuracy. And also, one little thing which, can you can work on, is as soon as the feeder hits the land, uh, hits the water, try and what we call feather it. Try and take the, the splash and the heavy bounce out of the feeder as it hits the water. So again with practice you just try and bring the rod up, it cushions that blow as that feeder lands and it lands more gently, not a great big crash, it won't affect the, the bait coming out. It's, it's practice and making things perfect like any sort of fishing but basic tips obviously help you get there in the first place. Okay, we've gone through that do put some work into casting straight and not whizzing it at 100 mile an hour. Now the feed has hit the water, um, say we're on a lake, it's sunk to the bottom and uh, now we're talking about the food starts to come out. My personal preference is because you've tried to feather the line and when the feeder lands the, 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 the hook, hook length will straight, go straight in a straight line, hopefully, but anyway. Once that's on the bottom, you're not sure what's going on. I actually prefer to leave it two or three minutes on the bottom of the river or the lake. Then I'll pick the rod up, move it a foot, and obviously what you're doing, you're moving the feeder along to empty the contents, but also bring into line your hook bait over where the contents has been deposited on the bottom of the lake. Okay, just looking at the rig quickly to see how it's set up. You can see I favour a running rig. More of a safety reason. If your line breaks or you crack off when you chuck out, the feeder is not fixed. Therefore, when a fish would take the bait that's on your line once you've chucked out, it will then allow that feeder just to come off the line and not be tethered to the fish. Um, another, we spoke about the clip link, that's important. And there you can see an all small green buffer bead. Um, buffer beads being rubber shot beads very important to take up the stress of that swivel hitting the knot and hitting the, the swivel where the hook is attached you may not be able to see it but there's a small indentation in that shot bead and that will go over the knot on the swivel and actually that just covers it protects it and then naturally crash 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 as that swivel bounces down it's going to take it out hence the name shot bead take it out on the bead and not damage your knot weaken your line and chance you're losing that big fish when you hook it right bream are shoalfish we nickname them as like grazers they'll graze over a big area so once they come across the ground bait that's been deposited from your swim feeder one thing I tend to do is in the initial session, part of the session, I'll cast on a more regular basis. Maybe put a slightly bigger feeder on just to start, 
with the clip, it'll come off quickly. Get a bit of grub out there. Get a bit of a car, a bit of food for them to start on. And then a shoal of bream, shoalfish, there's lots of them together. They'll graze over your area where you've been casting. And naturally, uh, quite often they'll bump into the line and you'll get an indication of a bite, but it's not a bite. It's something we call a liner, a line bite. And that's a false bite. And you've got to, in time, learn to differentiate between a false line bite and a proper bite. So initially, we say, sit in your hands, watch the quiver tip go around. But if it doesn't go around in a confident, long-term movement, it's a liner. So wait for it to develop, wait for the bite to develop and become evident what's going on. And bream, as I said, they're brushing your line. There's a lot of them in the swim. Several will be swimming over your line. So you've got to hold back and not rush and not strike uh, rapidly. Do a soft, gentle strike once you've got a confident bend on that tip and it's developed two or three seconds into the bite. Right, well, after that set up with uh, Dave, I'm down here at one of the pegs on the main lake of burial fisheries. And my quiver tips are out. I've got a mixture here of, you can see it, ground bait, nice bread, bran, bit of everything, and some pellets, There's drought pellets I've got in there, and what are they, eight mils I think, some four mil plain coarse pellets, some maggots, some sweet corn, so boy have they got a choice. Hopefully I'm going to see one of the equivalent tips go around in a minute. Beautiful. Humid, very, very humid. We, apparently we've got tropical air over us. Big, big whack of tropical air which is going to last 24 hours. That's why I'm out here. As are a lot of other guys. I guess they think of the carp are going to go nuts. I'm just hoping everything goes nuts. But from what I hear, the fish is actually pretty tough. Well, boys, Dave's tips about moving the feeder look like they've paid off with the first fish which has taken me an hour and indeedy just down there check it out is an ice bream ah, not a big fish but that's what i came for target species of cheese on oh yes yes typical bream covered in slime as they are but i tell you what that method of the open end swim feeder certainly does work. You know what he's been feeding on? <sighs> a leaf. It's getting back, it could be more in there. Little tip guys, just give your net a, a rinse because you never know if that is the only fish you're gonna catch. Because that bream slime dries on there. See a dip. I rinse out and what I do is flip it inside out. It's one of those sort of universal things. It just washes the slime off a bit. That way when you put it in the car, and it gets a hot sunny day, you won't be hard pushed to explain to the wife that it smells like you've got a dead body in there. Bream slime is shocking, but at the moment I'm grateful for it. I've got a classic mistake guys. It was windy when I got here. I've thrown out some balls of ground bait to get me started when I'm rigging up. And I think I've been overcasting with a feeder where I threw the ground bait because I'm getting those line bites. I started shortening up and I've got that fish. I'm going to put another little bit of bait closer in. Who knows? Oh, jeez, hang on, hang on, guys. Thanks for telling me. Fish on. I was just behind the chair, trying to set a second camera up to get some nice light shots there. And I could feel something vibrating, it was a rod coming out the rest. It's a good job you guys told me. And the planes have started out. This afternoon for about an hour, it's really peaceful here. No, they've started. I think this one might be a little bit bigger. Don't tear the heads off bream, you know, if you find them with a light rod, oh, this is a better fish, and the feeder is empty each time I pulled it in, so I'm not squeezing it, the feed in too hard. Oh, check this one out, people. This one is a proper old berry hill bream. Oh my word. Oh my word. 
Nearly lost the block as well, didn't I? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what a beauty! Maybe you got that in silhouette like that, guys. Should look pretty nice. Unfortunately, I want to turn the camera and I don't want this bream slime all over me. Yucky, yucky, yucky. Try and get you a better shot, hang on. There we go, I think you find the lights a little bit better this way. Oh, what? That's... Oh, no. Oh, check my trousers out. Oh, it's disgusting. I tell you what, I think I've got a film with the amount of slime all over my trousers. How in God's name of my age do I explain that to the wife? Good Bree. Let's get it back. I'd like to get another three or four out on the field if I could, but now's the time, bite time, it's dusk. That's a cracker. This is a cracker. So's that. Drive home with that now. Holy Christ. It's freaking everywhere. Oh, my bane is coming around to check my ticket in a minute. What's he going to think I've been doing for God's sake? Got to be a bloody penthouse in there. Gonna have to fish properly now. Right, okay, do the best I can. Switch this one off. I'm gonna stay the night if I can go carp fishing. I've got one rod out there, but I'm trying to plough my way through. Get you guys some tips on bream fishing. I'm getting in a right mess. Oh, that stuff is everywhere. Why am I making a video about film? A film about a bogey. Well, I'm going to have to do both of these at the same time. I'm going to give some tips in a minute. It is actually beautiful to find it. Beautiful evening. Look at that stillness there. I mean, that is, you know, that's worth coming for just that alone. It was a nice bream, but he didn't have to fall all over me. Those baits are okay. So we're just going to loosely pack that feeder. And what I'm going to do. I want to whack them in both at the same time. I've long been a fan of doing this. Two feeders hitting the water in close succession. Let's get this one ready. Shame those planes are starting up, it's just the way it is, I know. So what I'm doing, guys, size 12 on one, size 14 on the other. Get myself a grain of sweet corn. Every time I switch the camera on, a jet comes over. And now, here's a tip. You see, I've mixed maggots in there. You think there's no maggots in there, but the maggots always wriggle to the bottom. So dig around like that, and there you go. There's the maggots for your hook bait. I'm going to put three on this one. Crikey, O'Reilly, that roll was nearly coming out the rest, I have to say. It was coming out the rest. I just sort of felt the staging move. I cannot believe that bream is slimy that bad. I don't think I've ever had one do that to me in such a dangerous region. Anyway, here we go, boys. I want to drop them both in. You see there's a slight shadow line there. One in the left, one in the right. Not too far. Sinks, watch the rod top. Hits the bottom. I straighten out once. Slack off, put it down. Just trying to get it out and I get the second one out absolutely straight away. Now I haven't seen many bubbles there, which is a bit concerning, but that's quite a short one. Bump it once. Now I go around. Put it down. I'm fishing these very high up here. Purely because I like fishing them very high up. There's no rule and regulation and how you should fish swim feeder rods. And I fish one slightly outside the other one. I've just got tension in them. So hopefully you can see that just tensioned up like that. Look, you don't want it over too hard and you don't want it like that, because that's no bite detection. You can also, rather than turn the reel handle, if you have a single reel handle like this, when the reel handle gets to the top, the weight of it will pull the tip down. If you have balance handles with two like this, you don't get the same problem. So what you do is you just get the spool and you turn the spool like this to tension that rod tip. Keep turning it just so you've got a little, a little bit like that in there. 
just a little slight tension in there and that's what we're looking for but look at the setting here my word it's raining as well yeah just Christ we've got carp on boys we've got carp we've got carp on the camera holy cow drop it in gear that was absolutely now I've got to put a bit of dingo on this because look at the snags here and I don't want it kiting left this is not a small fish this is not a small one God. that's not a small fish boys oh he's gonna kite left maybe I'll get lucky I've got to lay it on him oh, he's going left he's going he's going left He's in. He's in the snake. Brilliant. Effing brilliant. Okay. Oh, son of a bitch. All right, fish went straight in the snags, guys. I'm not pulling for break here. I'm just leaving it sitting there. Either the hook's been dumped in there, or the lead's come off, boys. Who knows? I'm just waiting and watching to see if that rod top kicks. That rod top kicked and I missed it. Talking to you, Smith, again. Well, I tightened up. It looks like I've got everything back. Lo and behold, who would have thought that? I didn't have to pay, pull for break. Absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. That is bizarre. And I was over there, lock solid on that carp. Holy schmoly. How I never lost all that rig is beyond me. So the bream will have to wait because I've got to throw that bonus one out again just in case. Now that's one of the bonuses you do when you come to somewhere like Old Berry Hill is you can actually if you've got the three rod license if you've got one you can fish one rod on the feeder and chuck a carp rod out and there's every eventuality as you can see this that was a very big carp I had on. I've got to say that because I lost it. It was indeed a big carp and I was aiming out from the middle of that island as far as I could go. There we go, kaboom. Sink line straight away. Oh, the bream slime dried off a bit or something. One of the benefits of being over 65 is that it's very cheap. I get a reduced rate for the extra license. Boy, am I glad. Now I've got it. Check the bait runner. And we're going to get back to fishing for bait. Okay, so here's my baits. Sweet corn, I've got there. Yeah, this one I've got trout pellets here, so nice and oily. Caught bream on those before. They are, I think, eight mil pellets, those ones. Then we've got here some maggots. Really? Probably just tightening up with that bit of breeze. We've got maggots. I always get red and white because that way you can switch between the two. Try and keep them cool. These have been in the sun. Well, the sun. What there is in the sun are pretty warm, so you can see they're going completely bananas. Keep them cool. They will last longer. They can also go in the ground bait as well. Give them a little bit more in there. And, of course, the standard here, which is 4 mil, Just a 4 mil scratting coarse pellet. Don't even know... They do smell a bit, I suppose, and they do do a lot of carp feeding on these, so I feel the carp do know what they are. I actually put these in the bag with the broilies, and the broilies, just so in case you know, I'm not a broilie man, we're making a bream film. I just use these 18 mil ones to keep away from smaller fish, but definitely you can see that was a bonus rod. Here I'm catching bream, or hoping to catch bream, and you can see there, it was probably a 20 pound carp there, it lost me over by that duck over there. I just can't believe how he got me in a snag and I got the whole lot back, the whole rig. Very, very lucky. Anyway, gonna see if we can't get you another, another bream here.
Okay, guys, while we're waiting, we'll just run through something else for you. If, let's say, you're in very shallow water and you've got the feeder out there, you don't want to keep crashing that feeder into, say, a couple of feet of water if you're on a shallow estate lake, something like that. But you still want to add feed. Now, you can do that with a catapult. Now, Dave was telling me about these catapults. I did have one before, but I lost it. It's used for sending out baits like sweet corn, um, pellets, um, well, the small pellets and the big pellets, both the uh, fours and the eights. But as you can see, it's got a rigid cup there. So that stops them spreading apart. So when I used them before, I said, what well, a lot of trouble, they just spray everywhere on a really wide arc. And he said, yeah, but that's because I'm putting too many pellets. It's because he's a matchman, you see. He doesn't want to spread the fish. If they're in a big wide arc, you're moving fish away from your hook bait. You want them as narrow as you can get it. And he said, don't put too many in there and that will narrow it down. So I'm going to put some out, got some uh, different pellets. They also, by the way, guys, do this one. Oh, there's a bite and a half, small fish show. It's called an ultra slick rotation bearings. That's worth the money just for that, isn't it? Ultra slick rotation bearings. Wowie, I'm so impressed. Same principle, thinner elastic, smaller, lighter. We'll feed a fishing closer in. I do believe I have a customer. It's small, hang on. Bear with me for a moment, guys. Well, what if it's a big brain, but I think it's a, a little skimmer or something. In fact, I've missed them all together. Let me finish before this aeroplane comes. So I'm going to show you what I'm going to catapult out. Some of these, some of these. Won't bother with the mags. I'm saving those possibly for the morning. Guys, oh, it's gone off again. It's a bream. Definitely not a big carp. I'd say it's a bream. Anyway, look, it's a fish on the bonus rod. Coming in pretty quick. That's on a giant boiler that they said the bream won't take, but... If that's a carp, it's about 12 ounces. It's a fish. I'm not ungrateful for it, and we are making a bream video. And it is indeed a bream. Oh, let me show you this. A bream choking on a boilie. Don't even need a net. Look at that, guys. Hopefully, you can see this. A big old bream. And there is the boily. Well, well, well. Big fish, not a carp, but listen, it's a bream. It shows you the size of the bait that these bream will take. Let's get him back. Nice fish, though. And no slime. Oh, yes. It's a way to do it. I'm feeling there's a bite on this other one too. I fished, just when I got a pair of rods like that, I just fished one slightly inside the other. Does that, I don't have them so the lines cross. I fished one inside, right hand one inside, left hand one slightly further out. Let's check this one. I've got a feeling there's a small fish on there. There is indeed a small fish on there. Probably another skimmer. I think they do get perching, I'm not sure. This is a small fish. Oh. Not so small. Oh, just about nearly, nearly net material. And get yourself, kids, a disgorger like this plastic one. So you can't get the hook out, or you do like this. There's a split in it. Put the split in the line. Out comes the hook as easy as that. I mean, they're worth their weight in gold. These plastic disgorgers. Get off the hook. Put it either behind your ear or wherever you can find it again. Now, as a general rule, guys, I can only say a general rule, just maggots only will get the smaller fish. By tipping with a piece of sweet corn like this, you make a sandwich of it. Oh, I've got maggots here, haven't I? By tipping the sweet corn here, and the maggot as well, you make a little sandwich of it, and there's wiggles at both ends in. Bit of ground bit in there. Each time I come in, I make sure I haven't squeezed this too hard. I don't want it jamming in there. The idea, as Dave says, is that the feeder empties. That's the idea. Here comes a wind, so I've now lost my target zone. I might be slightly overcast there. If you overcast a swim, you tend to find you'll get liners because the fish are feeding between your feeder and you. So what I've got to do now is get that cart rod right out there. Well, guys, you can gather by the, the gloomy light, if you can even see this. 
there is another bream. I'm going to call it quits on the bream now and concentrate on these guys on the carp and I'll be back on the bream hopefully in the morning. Hopefully you see this one. He's in. So just fishing the one rod at the moment. There's a nice small size bream. Average, average, that's all it is, average. With the hook just basically sort of nicked itself. And away he goes. Bye. So bream in the morning guys. I'm gonna have a go on the carp. You got some tips from Dave there. Had a fish to feeder, and I've had them on the feeders. Hope it doesn't rain tonight. A bit ominous up there. And uh, I'm going to concentrate on that when it's daylight. The carp will shut down. I'll come back on the bream again. Fingers crossed we get some more fish in the morning. And see you guys in a few hours. Right, people. I've done my uh, obligatory nights carp fishing. And of course, there's some people out there that want to go all night fishing for tench, all night fishing for bream. If you do, and you're uh, staying out all night, and you want some stuff in the morning to eat, I'm just going to have a breakfast now. Once you get one of these Tupperware containers, put your cornflakes, your raisins, your cereal in there, okay? And then if you've got a flask, you can keep your milk cold as well. A bit floral, isn't it, really? But that's what the wife gave me. So I've already pounded that area with ground bait just about where that coot is going over now. I'm going to have my breakfast here. In fact, there's a fish under there. If you saw it, it made the, made the coot jump. Could be bream, could be carp. Uh, and then I'm going to have this to eat, and then I'm going to rig up, bring the carp rods in, change over, and I'm going to give it a few hours, a couple of hours on the bream, see if I can get a few more bream for you. Let's get breakfast going. Oh, it's fallen on the floor. I won't be picking it up. Hmm. Well guys, what I've done is I've got my rods now, because this wind has come up, down low. I've got them set like this. Look, you can set quiver tip rods up pretty well how you want. There's no rules and regulations. And that's why I've got them low. Because you might not know this, but when I was fly fishing for bonefish, we always used to know that if you're fly fishing horizontally, the last three feet above the water, there's slightly less, slightly less wind and you could do a sideways cast. Now that's the same principle I applied here, I'm trying to get my rod tops down low rather than up in the air where it catches the wind and I've just had that one fish. <clears throat> the problem I've got is with the ripple I can't see my two shallow lines that I'm casting to quite so accurately. But that's my setup. Walk you down, that's the angle I've got the tips on. I'm getting lots of uh, small bites but nothing has converted since that last bream. So I'll give it an hour or so. I have on the go here a brew that is just just boiled you cannot be a brew let's turn that off because it's Michael's gas <laughs> does he know I've got it does he know I've got all his gear and a bit of grub these aren't bad just get these sort of pastry things these have got chocolate in them it gives you a bit of a boost as well there's a bite on that left hand rod and I missed it, but I've got them in the buzzers just there as well. So if I am looking away or I'm over here messing around with the camera, so I've got to do some arty shots in a minute, um, at least I can hit the buzzer and I might not miss that fish. Now I've been packing up guys, as you can see, and the rod's, rod's gone round again, the quiver tip rod, and different species, no bream. There we go. Quite a nice little roach. So you can see that the uh, Feeder method does work, give it a go. Always keep that disgorger happy by sliding it down, popping the hook out, how easy was that? Unbelievable, whoopsie, over the jumper again. Back he goes. I'm gonna check this one, no, there's nothing on this, the wind is howling now, so I haven't got much longer left. The maggots, look guys, have been chewed and sucked to oblivion, that tells me there are roach here, so maybe, the bream aren't in there, and I might just have a last cast, we say a couple of red maggots, because if they're sucking down from four, 
and chewing away at them, that means it's probably just small roach here, so maybe I should settle for three. I don't want to go too far. I'll make that the right hand, left hand rod. Then I could be packing up, you see, because I've got these quiver tips on buzzers. It gives me the beauty of being able to pack up at the same time. I've heaved my uh, bonus boilie rod out over there. Got fish on. I've allowed for moving around and packing stuff up. And I've actually moved my other carp buzzers to the side here and I've got the quiver tip in the buzzers. And that one definitely, definitely got me a fish. No question, guys. Might be a skimmer. Who knows? Oh, a bit bigger than a skimmer. Well, that I didn't even get the second one up. That's a big fish to lift on your rod, Graham. The other system that's going to work is grain a sweet corn like that, shorten the hook link up, and just a couple of maggots on there. Now, this has been left out, and we had rain last night. So it's slightly wet, but I never mix all my ground bait up in one go with water. I do, let's say, the top third. That way, I can get to the dry stuff, look, right down the bottom. See? In here, it's dry. So if it is too wet from, you know, rain going in there or whatever, or you've made it too wet, you can reconstitute it by getting the stuff from the bottom dry. And that's what I've just done here this morning, because I realised it was... Now, I'll give you another tip. Man alive! I must have slept a bit last night, I wouldn't be full of all these tips otherwise. Same happened with the maggots. Left them out with the lid on, but they're vented lids, so the water gets in. The maggots won't get out, they try and get out because they can stick to the sides. I've always made, already made a mistake of putting the bucket with maggots in it inside the bivvy last night when it started to rain where it is a bit wet. And of course the maggots now have wriggled out and crawled all over the inside of Michael's bivvy. Do not tell him anybody, please. You can see those maggots are wet. Get yourself some dry ground bait again. Sprinkle it in there. And that, if you leave the lid open, will stop them crawling up the sides and crawling all over your bank and deck and losing them, basically. It's only a small tip. All these small tips, in the long run, to be honest, will catch your fish. They all add up. And I do not want rain. Right, let's get back out there again. Well, got a nice bream on, guys. Feels like a nice bream anyway. Been a little bit slow. Is that change in the pressure, wind pressure's gonna do it. It's a nice little bream here. He is toast, he is in. There we go. I fully intend not getting slimy with this guy. There's a nice berry hill bream. There are lots and lots in here. Look, you don't have to use a feeder, just giving you a few tips. There we go guys, thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. I'm gonna get this guy back in the water. Together with his slime, yak. Glue. Guys, I was just packing up with a spod rod <laughs> and it just went screaming off. I thought, oh my god, I've got a carp. I put a huge amount of pressure on it. It's got a really nice carp here. A carp? What are those green things called? Really nice tench. Check this guy out. <laughs> I think this one, I might have to try and find some scales somewhere, people. Bear with me, I was packing the mat up and everything. This is a nice tent. Oh, holy shit. My God, look at this tent. Oh, what a result. Just put in. Let's come around there a little bit, get you a better shot. Just putting that boilie out in the hope 
gonna, he's gonna leap and thrash. Look at the size of that tench, people. There's the boilie, let's get him unhooked. Man, what a beauty. That is a bonus. It's one of my big attention this season, to be honest. I know it's on a carp, but it's on 0, 0.0 fight on a spod rod. But boy, what a good job I chucked it out. Beautiful fish.